Let's have a closer look at how technology actually evolves. There is a method to this accelerating madness and we can actually find some contours of this evolution, which are important to understand in order also to make predictions of, of what will happen and, and when things will happen. Right next to me here in my office, I have this collection on this in this shelf closet of different technology, communication and information technology that nowadays, my ambition is to collect everything that nowadays fits into a mobile phone, basically. And so while I'm on my trips around the world, I sometimes run into some old technologies like all these photography technologies, picture taking technologies, flashlights and so forth, or different computational technologies or different entertainment technologies that we nowadays have in our phones from card games until, until music player and, and telecommunication technologies. All of that now fits into our phones. So certainly there has been technological progress. But I want you to notice as well, I mean, there are different generations of different answers to similar questions. For example, this telephone here is quite different than these telephones here. Or this calculator, the abacus, also calculates. Same as these vacuum tubes. There's a different uh, embedment into a different physical structure, but it also solves a calculation logic. So what's going on here? So things become better, but they also are different within them. And so let's have a closer look during this lecture at, at how technological evolution actually advances. So let's take a typical need as an example. And the typical need that I propose that we look at is how to store high quality sound for later consumption. That's a typical need. So it's worthwhile to have technology that addresses that typical need. And we assume that performance in answering this question has improved over time. Well, one of the first ones, and not absolutely the first one, as you know, any invention is just new combinations of existing things, or nothing comes out of nowhere, not even the wheel, by the way. So let's look at the tinfoil wrap, Thomas Edison. We already talked about the, this crazy inventor a lot. We had one of the first important in, inventions of storing music for later consumptions on tinfoil. Before that, you couldn't really do that with, with high quality sound. So if you wanted to listen to Mozart, you need to get Mozart. And that's why we also don't have any recording of these genius musicians because nobody could really record it. And then it was like magic. Suddenly you could capture sound in a physical structure for later consumption. And that then has evolved in different generations over time. Let's first of all look at like what are the what is the nature of this progress? And I, and I probably gave, if you paid attention on the previous lecture, you already know the answer to that. I already gave it away. So the basic contour of this progress and what is it. But then also you want to look at more in detail in these different wave-like structures that continuously build onto each other. So we see that this happens in concrete. We could call them jumps, for lack of a better word. These are disruptive innovations. And these jumps that we call, call, call jump here, very lax. In biology, we call them punctuated equilibriums. It's the same logic. I say biology also tirelessly tinkers, trying to find new combinations of things and then finds punctuated equilibriums. So it's not a continuum between the lion and the house cat. There is a punctuated equilibrium that nature found and then there's a lion, there's a house cat. There's some in between and we don't cover everything in between. And the same here. There are some concrete jumps. Sometimes we find something, sometimes out of luck, you know, a, a blind hen that picks around, sometimes finds a, a piece of a piece of corn. And sometimes we have it pinpointed and we, we, we aim for something. But there we find something. That's then these that creates these jumps, these disruptive innovations. And also pay attention that within here there's continuous innovation. So we'll talk about that. And then overall, we see that these disruptions, actually, the cycle here decreases. And we talked already a lot about that. So the effect of this then is if you make it a line, you get exponential progress. So technological progress uh, happens both in jumps and is exponential. Let's look at both of them separately. I already said here, this the story with the jumps is the story of punctuated equilibriums where we can see 
that things progress. And also within the vinyl records, they became better. So the vinyl records back here were much superior to the vinyl records here. The vinyl records here at the beginning, they had very thick needles. They were almost like as thick as a nail. And the vinyl records, records back here, they had very thin needles. They could play very fine, like DJs were using them or still using them in discotheques in order to, to you know, do very fine grained uh, manipulations on this, on this audio storage device. So the technology becomes continuously better, but then sometimes disruptions happen. So let's look at this a little bit more in detail. The theory of technological innovation. I'm gonna break it down here in, in, in two slides and hope it's not too, too overwhelming, but it's actually quite intuitive. So here we have Graham Bell who invented the first phone. And from there on, there was a continuous pro progress of making phones better. And even the fixed line phone became much better. I mean, this phone here is much better, much higher quality than this phone over here. You could barely understand him when he uttered the first words through a telephone. Watson, come here, I need you. Glad that Watson understood, but that was very low quality. This phone is certainly better, still a fixed line phone. And then there are disruptive technological progress. The mobile phone, a new paradigm. Not everybody gets to enjoy every wave of technological progress. We will never connect all Africa with fixed line phones. No, we will leapfrog the fixed line story and jump directly to mobile phone. And now most people in Africa have our telephony covered, but not with a fixed line phone. We didn't go through the same progression as we did in, in developed countries. We just basically jumped there and said, well, don't need to go there, let's jump to the next wave. We leapfrogged, that's a technical term, and went to the mobile phone. Now also the mobile phone progressed ever since the mobile phone, uh, the first mobile phone was created and they became undoubtedly better. And then there is a new disruption and we solve a similar problem of communication, probably in the future differently. I don't know, this is dubious speculation on my part, but probably looks something like this, or I don't know, maybe we put a chip in our brain or we put little you know, bathing suit caps on that communicate with our brain, or like probably with the glasses, I, who, who knows? Or, or maybe we continue to have a phone in our hand, I doubt it, that's probably some kind of variable. And so, and so the progression goes between, and they also become better then. Probably the first bathing suit caps we put on and <laughs> dubious speculation are probably, no, not very good. And then future generations will be better. So let's make this entire thing a little bit more schematic because these changes can be structural, material or symbiotic system changes. So if I now create a little graph of a space of technological possibilities, I can say, so this is a fixed line phone and here are my different dimension. That's the quality with which it communicates, that the speed with which it transmits, that's the weight, what it's made out of. Is it made out of metal or out of plastic? This is the durability of it. So I have different dimensions that define my technological space. And then I have, our engineers, you know, tinkering there away and see like, okay, what can I combine with what in order to make this technology work? And over time they tinker and they make it better. But the technological space itself, the kind of like the dimensions, the solution, qualitatively stays the same. Then we call it continuous innovation. Whereas, so we improve an existing technological space, often through material or scale improvement. So we just improve the material, we make something lighter, for example, we replace uh, metal with aluminum or, or with some kind of durable plastic. We make things in a scale, we make things smaller, or we make things faster, we make things larger, but we explore the same technological space. Like this is just puzzle solving, same puzzle, but we solve it uh, quicker, for example. Now a disruptive technological innovation changes the technological space. So I don't have the same technological space anymore where before I solved the problem completely differently. And somebody comes up and says, hey, you actually don't need any metal with it. Actually, you don't need any material. You can do the same thing in software. Woo, that's, uh, that's a different technological space. Still has constraints, but the constraints are very different. But then also there I innovate. The software might become better and become better, it might become faster, might become smaller might become more durable, less, have less bugs and so forth. And so I continue. So this is, well, sure, long story short, that's the theory of technological innovation. So that's how you can think about it. There's disruptive and continuous innovation. Now let's look at some empirical evidence, some you know, footprints that we left behind that can be observed if this theory actually holds in reality. Here we have a technology 
the aircraft. What's the aircraft evolution? Well, first of all, I need to define here the y-axis. What do we put on here? I just said, like the y-axis becomes better, like better of what? Like what typical need do you express? Do you want the airplane to become faster or do you want it to be bigger and carry more weight? You know, there is not the same thing. So if you try to solve a technological puzzle as an engineer, you have to first of all define what do you want, fast or big? Because fast might not be big or might be, but not necessarily. So these are two different problems. And then you create a technological space of trying to address that need. And you can clearly see here, there are some periods with fast growth and some periods with slower growth and then fast growth and slower growth. You can see here the two periods of fast growth have to do with disruptive innovations. In that case, with the introduction of the propeller, that's a technological space. And then somebody said, well, hey, no, like, well, he recombined things and then they came up with a jet engine. So the jet engine is a different technological space. Then still the jet engine over time became better and better. And you can see here that when we have disruptive innovation, things go very fast. Right, it's like, you know, in recent years, the advancement of artificial intelligence, things go very fast when there's a disruption in something. The, the disruption of artificial intelligence was a discovery of deep neural nets. But look, I, I purposely don't talk so much here about deep neural nets and software and computation and so forth, because the theory is the same. But it's much easier to think about jet engines and propellers than to think about deep neural nets. But once you understand the theory, you can apply it really. There's, there's nothing different uh, in the digital paradigm. We will get back to that. So just in a little bit. And then, of course, if I take another technological knee, like another need to be addressed, I get this here. I, well, I didn't, I didn't really look up what were the innovations here, but you can also distinguish periods of fast and slower growth. And faster growth is usually that there's disruptive innovation going on, and slower growth is continuous innovation. And we will talk more about that in the next lecture. What happens during continuous innovation is we diffuse the technology. Because like we have, we have a stable space, we have, we have a technology. We have propeller airplanes. Now, we need to have them and then we need to sell them. So then we sell them and we sell them, we diffuse them, we get everybody a propeller airplane. Now if that's then done, then we disrupt again. And then we sell it again. And there's no need to innovate there right now because first of all, we have to get the money back and we have to sell them. So it diffuses in society, which is important because then society gets more technologized and advances. And that's how this logic goes. If we would always have disruptive innovations, there would be like, what would be an airplane? Is it a propeller? Is it a, is it a jet? Like, what are you actually talking about when you mean airplane? So that's how these things combine. We will get back to that in the next lecture when we talk about the diffusion of innovation. Here we talk about what innovation actually is. But let's look at more the digital paradigm. So this here is telecommunication and our telecommunication advanced. And telecommunication started here with the mailman. So back then the mailman transmitted a certain bandwidth of kilobits per US dollar. And this is the amount of kilobits per US dollar, kilobits per second per US dollar that the mailman delivered. That's this part here in blue. And then you see the telegraph killed it. I mean, this is just like much faster for, for certain languages, media richness theory. You remember what that is from our previous lecture about digital traits. It tells you that some of the things you can substitute with, tele, with the telegraph. Then here became the telephone, radio and broadcasting, much cheaper to transmit. And then you see here the blue is binary code. The digital just blew everything out of the water. It's going extremely fast. You can see a similar trajectory, similar waves when you look at storage technology. This is hard disk and RAM storage. And you can see a wave-like trajectory. And I should have distinguished here between different technological evolutions. I, I'm not, but I, what I'm trying to show here you, there are these waves also in digital technology. And let's look at computational technology, the driver of the current paradigm, the paradigm of knowledge and algorithms. Uh, here you also see different calculations. Here at the beginning, there was manual calculators. That was pretty stagnant. And uh, check it out. Uh, a Japanese master in the abacus uh, was faster than the fastest technological computer until the 1950s. So these abacus uh, manipulations, the humans were extremely fast, also using a technology. The technology was the abacus. And, and then the innovation kind of like tampered down here with mechanical, electromechanical. We didn't know what we were doing, but everybody laughed about it because it was kind of like so useless. And that's what often, ha often happens. Technology at the beginning is quite useless. So e-commerce, I mean, it took at the beginning, there was a lot of hype and then it took 10 years until it recovered and then really hit hard. And the same might happen to modern, uh, artificial intelligence. 
the AI winter took, you know, almost 70 years. Like we didn't really understand what was going on there. It was below actually what humans could do. And we were laughing about it. But then exponential, once it breaks, it goes on. And this is already in a logarithm. You probably have to take the double logarithm here if you want to combine analog computation with more automated and especially with digital computation. This here, the digital uh, microprocessor paradigm, is uh, has very specific particularity, which is very famous. And this is what dragged the current paradigm along, which dragged humankind along. And it's known as Moore's Law. Gordon Moore uh, is co-founder and CEO of Intel, the chip maker. And what Gordon Moore observed quite some time ago is that the complexity for minimum component cost has increased at a rate of roughly a factor of two per year. What that means is, and that was back in the 60s, he basically says chips, computational microchips, they, become, they double in their performance every year. So they double. And people have said, no, it's not a year, it's a year and a half, it's whatever, it's two, it doesn't really matter. Once you have an exponent, <laughs> so powerful, it doesn't matter if it's a year or a year and a half. And you can see here, ah, good that we talked about that. They took the logarithm here on this, and this is the number of transistors. So what is what this paradigm consisted of is continuous innovation. Whereas they made the thing smaller and smaller, and they made it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So they had a technological space, the same technological space, the microchip design is, was basically the same, and uh, they packed more transistors onto it. That was continuous innovation by scale. You were in the same paradigm and then packed onto it. And, you know, once you, you find a cow like that that you can milk, you better milk it. And whoa, did we milk that cow, right, from the 1960s onward until the 2020s. And then the big discussion started, is Moore's Law dead and you will hear this discussion often because you know when you make these things smaller and smaller and smaller you then start to hit the quantum level and in quantum level there is there might be quantum computers someday when they when they really work and, and some of them already do work but for traditional but that would be a different technological space you see that would be disruptive innovation whereas the traditional microchip when you make them smaller and then you start with quantum effects you don't really compute because then it becomes probabilistic it, it, it's not a, a computation that you can foresee you need to do another kind of thing a different technological space and quantum computer might be the next thing or i don't know three-dimensional computers or optical computers we don't know what will be the next thing after moore's law but there's this big discussion have we now in you know, the 2020s uh, come broad Moore's law to an end. And <clears throat> you know, the, the CEO of NVIDIA, another big chip maker, said, yes, Moore's law is definitely dead. And the CEO of Intel, Intel the, the current CEO of Intel, said, it, no, the opposite. Moore's law is still alive. So I don't know. That's, it's not so important to, to, to see it. Time will tell if we can still milk this continuous innovation or if there's a disruptive innovation. If you don't find a disruptive innovation, things might slow down. But usually when they slow down, you know, a lot of financial interest will come in to try to solve and continue this, and a big disruption will happen that, that will move that forward. Now, continuing with some example from, from technology, it doesn't only have to be hardware, like transistors and chips that you can actually touch. It can also be software. Now, in software, it's more difficult what we measure on the, on the performance axis, and there are different proposals on what we measure. But also just looking at it, uh, pro computer languages have evolved in different jumps, in different generations. Starting with Ada Lovelace. Ada, Ada of course, our, our big Harry, and she, she, she invented the first computer languages, the first computer programmer. Uh, and with there, she is still like up there, the, the, the Harry of, of, of most of us uh, who, who know a little bit of programming, because that was just a genius move, a genius disruptive innovation that she came up with using language and actually using language to program machines. And let's look at how the machines evolved. So there we have Fortran. It's well, certainly not the first uh, computer programming languages that Ada Lovelace was, was a century ahead. But Fortran was a, a big one for the digital paradigm. Ada Lov Lovelace programmed Babbage calculator machine. That was a mechanical rattle thing that she actually programmed. But a digital machine, there's Fortran, there's Argol, there's BASIC here, and you can see different generation, continuous innovation, Fortran, one, two, three, four, and so forth. And then you can see also there's 
new combinations of other computing languages. For example, Fortran and Algol got, got combined here and you can go forward in the different years. So here we are in the 80s, we are uh, here coming to the 90s and here you can see an innovation that we still use, I use and many of us use Python. Python is also a new combination of different computer languages, programs that, that existed before in the 1990s. It came together and from there on, Python had continuous innovations. As we all know, as each one of us who has to update their Python, and no, this is written in Python, too, but it doesn't run on Python then because this is continuous innovation in Python. But you also have different computing languages, for example, Java, you have down here, or here you have some that is being revived, Haskell, for example. And you can see that also these computer languages over time, we are we here we are in the 2000s, continue to evolve. Here we are in Python. This, this chart goes until, ooh, where are we? 2009, 11. And you can see how actually things evolve, right? Here we have Python 3.4. That's where, oh no, actually it keeps on going. 2020, here we have Python 3.9. So here's Haskell, a computer language that has been recently re-resuscitated, re-survived on the blockchain. Actually, Haskell was born here in 1987, it was born, and recently has been used by the blockchain called Ada Cardano. Ada, because of Ada Lovelace. That's why they call this blockchain Ada and they program basically with an evolution of Haskell. So now I zoomed out here and you can see actually this is the evolution of programming languages. And we're not going to study it. You're welcome to study it. And you could also, you could if you have some kind of performance measure, now put that on the Y axis and see whatever you think improved. Coding speed improved or whatever you think might have improved. And here then you end up uh, with Python 3.9 and Java 15. So that also evolved in different generations in jumps. So this also evolved in different generations in concrete jumps and each of them again coming because of new combinations that represent a disruption in the paradigm and then based on that there's continuous innovation. So also in something as intangible as program languages we have disruptive and continuous innovation. So let's look with a little bit more detail into the exponential logic. We said, okay, so there are these different generations of, of technologies that have disruptive innovations between them and within there's continuous innovation. But then if I tie them all together and I just look at the technological trajectory, zooming out bird's eye view, 10,000 feet view, what I see is that these innovation cycles become shorter and shorter. It took 50 years from the tinfoil rap recording until the vinyl record in only 15 years from the CD until the MP3. So if I now you know, just draw one line and say, what's the technological progression of sound storage technology, I actually do find an exponential here. And so this is also sometimes how it's presented. It's just one continuous curve that just goes upwards. And that's what we call then technological progress. The person who has been talking probably most about the exponential nature of technological progress has been Ray Kurzweil, a serial entrepreneur, and I, I strongly encourage you to, to check him out and check his writings out. He contributed with many big inventions and has also worked in, in one of the most, some of the most important companies, I think for Google, he worked for a long time and so forth, and a serial entrepreneur. And he studied a lot in detail this exponential nature, and uh, he has this law of accelerating returns, uh, encourage you to check it out and check out his, his writings and understanding that allows him to make predictions. And he made many predictions about future technologies that actually came to fruition because he just understands these exponentials and then makes prediction with these exponentials. And they might be surprising for people, but he just said, well, if it's just continuous innovation and then I, you know, I just can make exponential predictions and he hit the, he hit the nail on the head much more than most others. And he says the secret sauce for that in order to be able to predict the future is understanding exponential. Now humans are extremely bad in, in thinking in exponential because we think linearly. We think, you know, the future will evolve one year after the other. Clock time is linearly, whereas progress time is exponential. 
And the metaphor that he uses, and I have it from this article, the seminal article that many people refer to, is the, the metaphor of the second half of the chessboard. And you will hear that when you talk with people in a company or with people involved in technology. Sometimes somebody will just say, yeah, you know, second half of the chessboard. And so what, what, where is that coming from? And I probably read you exactly of what Kurzweil writes here in this article. He says, well, he's fond of telling the tale of the inventor of chess and his partner. Like, okay, so that's first, chess is a metaphor. There wasn't an inventor of chess. You know, this has evolved with new combinations. Oh, okay, all right, sorry. <laughs> and the emperor of China. In response to the emperor's offer of a reward for his new beloved game, the inventor asked for a single grain of rice on the first square. So the emperor said, I'm going to reward you for inventing chess. And then the inventor said, OK, that's I'm very humble. I just want a single grain of rice on the first square, two on the second, four on the third and so on. So exponentially just increase the number of grains of rice on each square of the chessboard. The emperor quickly granted the seemingly benign and humble request. One version of the story was that the emperor went bankrupt as the 30, uh, 63rd doublings ultimately totaled, totaled 18 million trillion grains of rice. At 10 grains of rice per square inch, this requires rice field covering twice the surface of the earth, oceans included. Another version of the story is that the inventor of chess lost his head. You know? So it should be pointed out, says Kurzweil, that as the emperor and the inventor went through the first half of the chessboard, things were fairly, fairly uneventful. The inventor was given spoons full of rice, then bowls of rice, then barrels and a few more barrels. By the end of the first half of the chessboard, the inventor had accumulated one large field's worth, four billion grains. And the emperor did start to take notice by then. It was as they progressed through the second half of the chessboard that the situation quickly deteriorated for the emperor. Incidentally, with regard to the doublings of computational, that's about where we stand right now, he says. So this is when people bring that up, right? So it says, when you get to the second half of the chessboard, you start to notice when things happen. Now they always go exponential, but you people use the metaphor of the second half of the chessboard to refer to the fact that when it, when it becomes interesting for us, so where computational computational power stands for right now, it approaches to kind of like hardware computations. People say like what happens in our brain, the amount of neurons firings and the amount of click clacks that happen in a computer get to a similar order of magnitude. Now exponential techno technological progress continues at the second half of the chessboard even. And that's when either the emperor goes bankrupt or the other one loses his head. So that's what this refers to. Now, if you look at technological progress, this is per calc this is uh, calculations per second per thousand US dollars. It's always been exponential. So if I show you the graph here from the 1900s and I show you before, it's been very flat with you know with the mailman and so forth. And you can see here it goes up. And if you just if you don't take the logarithm, it it seems like whoa immediately in the past. In, in the recent three years, it just exploded. Now, this was the 1980s. So in the 1980s, it really exploded. What if we move a little bit forward? In the 1990s, it also seemed like in the last few years, it really exploded. And if you go to the 2000s, it seems like, well, in the last few years, it really exploded. Before the second half of the first half of the chessboard, nothing happened. But once you reach the second half of the chessboard, it really exploded. Now, that's just that's just the nature of exponential growth. It just, the steps become so big with every doubling that actually if you take the logarithm, and we talked about that before, it just looks like a straight line. There might be some wiggles, so disruptive in it, then we don't get really into it, but at the end you can put a straight line through that in a, on a semi, semi log plot. So this here is linear, this is exponential, and that's what I showed you before. So what here kind of like is the hockey stick, they call it the hockey stick graph, this basically becomes a straight line here when you put it. And that's the nature of it. So the second half of the chessboard is not so much about that now it's more suddenly, it's certainly more, and it's certainly faster in that sense, but not qualitatively different. It's always been that in the last few years, most things happened, but it has more to do with, now it becomes critical for something else, like for us humans, that computers get to our capacity. 
See, so that's what the what the second half of the chessboard refers to. Now, exponential growth, let's look at something I've been working with a lot. And, and I already told you, so we measured once the amount of information has been growing in the world. And most people in academia, they just know me for that, for counting bits. And I spent four years of my life together with my co-authors here to count bits. And there are a lot of bits in the world. But then what we figured out is what is the growth of, of the world's storage capacity. And we can see what we figured found out is that Spoiler alert, it grows exponentially fast. And the amount of information that humankind can store doubles about every two and a half years. So what does doubling actually mean? So when it doubles, what did I do? I took the logarithm of base two, right? And then I find my doubling rate and it's every two and a half years. So if you would take, so in the year 2014, there are five setabytes. Now, if I would take these five setabytes that humankind was able to store in the year 2014 and put them in books, so I convert all the bits and bytes into letters and put them in books and make a pile of book. How high do you think the pile would go? How high would be the pile of books? Would it go to the moon? Would it go from Earth all the way to the sun if we stored all of our information that we can store in, in books? Well, it go, would go to the sun, but it would go to the sun 4,500 times. So it would be 4,500 piles of books from the earth to the sun. And from the earth to the sun, it's 91,000, 91 million miles, excuse me. So if you drive 70 miles an hour, you would have to drive 150 years to get from the earth to the sun in your car. So you drive 100, you will pass a lot of books. And you have to drive 4,500 times. You pass a lot of books driving the 70 miles an hour for 150 years, 4,500 years. So we have a lot of information stored in the world's technological capacity to store information. And now I said we double it every two and a half years. What does that mean? That means every doubling, we add as much information as we had since the beginning. Since the beginning of civilization, since we saw the story, since we painted Caves, the cave paintings are probably the first information storages. And we produce a lot of information since then. And now we double that not in, in only two and a half years. Because that's what doubling is, right? And that's probably the last time I'm going to bore Maybe not. I'm going to bore you with my combinatorial exponential uh, animations uh, for today. But it's important for me that you understand. It because humans are extremely bad, as Kurzweil always says, extremely bad. In, in thinking exponentially, we think linearly. And linearly is here, you know, one, two, three, four, five, but if you do the exponentials, the doublings, we could actually see that here, you know, it, it goes by a doubling rate. So what does that mean? Well, at the beginning, we have one block of information. Let's say we have five setabytes here, and then the next one, we double it. So then we would have 10. And we add the same amount as we has, have had had since the beginning. And then in the next doubling rate already, we double all of that. So we add one to it. And the next one, we double all of that. We add two to it. So we grow by two. And now in the next one, we add as much as we had accumulated since the beginning of time. All right? So we add another four. And then in the next one, we add another eight. So every exponential progress, you can just take the logarithm of two, you get a doubling rate. And that means an that makes it easy to think about it qualitatively. It's intuitive because you say in every step, you add as much as you had since the beginning of this progress. And that's actually, you know, it's, it's quite amazing that it, we think that in the next two and a half years, we will add the same amount of storage capacity roughly if our progression holds as we had accumulated since the cave paintings. That's a fast progress. And that's the power of exponentials. So technology progresses exponentially. OK, so oof, wait. OK, so wait. So how does technology evolve? Well, we make it short, disruptive and continuously and exponentially fast. So we said it's disruptive and continuously, what I at the beginning hand wavily called jumps with disruptive innovations, with intermittent continuous progressions of improvement. And it happens exponentially fast, which comes out of the combinatorial logic. And that's how technology evolves.